So, um, Hugh McIlvanny is the obvious place to start, isn't he? I think so. I'll uh, defer to Paul. You knew him. Yeah, I, I, uh, I did know him. Um, there's a uh, report on the Mayo Roscommon game last night. I thought about this. So, a report on the Mayo Roscommon game of Michael Clifford, and there's a line in it. He's talking about the slapstick proportions of the game. And there's a line in it that says, in keeping with the Laurel and Hardy feel to the evening. So, what age are you? 50. 50. Joe? 33. You ever hear of Laurel and Hardy? Rings a bell, yeah. Right. <laughs> just the bell. Rings a bell. I'm joking, come on. Okay, you're no. right, okay. But just well, everyone knows Laurel everyone and knows Hardy. Them, yeah, yeah. Everyone knows yeah, yeah. There's a new movie out last week, Laurel and Hardy. I know, I know that, but yeah. really, you say everyone knows it. People under the age of 50 wouldn't really appreciate Laurel and Hardy. I mean, I did. I thought they were fantastic. But okay. I don't think people under the age of 50 really would. Like everything in sport, uh, there's always comes with a uh, you know a competitor. You know, you're Laurel and Hardy, or you're Abbott and Costello. You know, the, you couldn't be both fans. Right, of both, now you're you know. confusing Joe. He has no idea who Abbott and Costello are. <laughs> uh, so I remember a friend of mine checking into the Shelburne Hotel uh, with his partner, and uh, they'd come off a long flight uh, from uh, California. And uh, as they were checking into the Shelburne, the guy who was greeting them said, "This is the hotel where Laurel and Hardy stayed." That's a very famous hotel in Dublin there, Laurel and Hardy. Right. Where are we going with this? We're talking so about as, Hugh as, McElvenny. As a preface to okay. Hugh McElvenny, I mean, are you, are, you, are you, were you a reader? Did you know him? Did you read him? Joe? Not you, enough. Not enough? No, not enough. No. Yeah. See, I'm interested in that as well, because again, you had to be really to appreciate McElvenny. I would suggest you probably had to be 50, really. Anything younger than that, you wouldn't really have... Uh, appreciated how good he was and what he did and why the papers are so full of him today really I suppose yeah well you had to be 50 plus you had to be getting English papers into the uh, in, into your household that's, which that's, is that's not, a good uh, point. not wasn't common no, you know no, no. Uh, we used to get all the papers uh, on the Sunday into our house but rarely would we get an English paper yeah, uh, and he was writing for the Observer. Uh, if he did get an English paper, it would have been the Times on Sunday. So, it, it and it was before the internet and easy access to these articles. So, an awful lot of these articles and his quotes have come as uh, new to me. Yeah, um, and fortunately, uh, the papers have put a lot of his articles up online, which is well. Good I think for us. in the coverage today, I think Tommy Conlon sets the tone of it uh, perfectly with his intro. When a beloved figure enjoys a long and quiet retirement, the pangs of sadness provo provoked by their final parting are often softened by the slow fade into privacy that preceded it. So it's the pangs of sadness, really, I think, that uh, a lot of us people above 50 and who work in the newspaper business and in sports in particular feel, have been feeling since it was announced that Hugh had, uh, had passed away. And um, that's reflected pretty much in, in all of the, uh, the coverage today. The, the sadness of the passing of someone who was not just a sports writer, but an iconic, a, an, an iconic writer himself. Mm. Um, and that's reflected again in the, in the wit of the, uh, of the coverage today. You know, there are a lot of great p pieces. The one that I really, really enjoyed was um, in the news review, actually, of the Sunday Times, and it was written by Donald Trafford, who was his editor when he was at the Observer, when Hugh was at his best, mm. really. And uh, he's written a tremendous, a tremendous piece about what it was like to uh, to work with uh, Hugh McIlvanny. And one paragraph in particular jumped out because I could relate to it. Um, and he's talking about his genius, and the quote is. These flashes of wit, though typical of his conversation, belie the agony that went into his writing. Mm. Uh, in 2005, uh, I shared a house with him in, at St Andrews during the Open. There was four Sunday Times writers there. And Hugh, uh, Hugh was with us. And I remember coming back. I was ghost of Nick Faldo, and I was finished early for once in my entire career. And came back to the house, and Hugh was in his room um, Pat Collins, another great writer from the, the Mail, alluded to this earlier in the week. He'd, he'd been with him in Vegas, covering the fight, world title fight, about 30 years ago. And he, 
he told a story about coming into Hugh's room on the morning after he'd filed his piece and just like, like, like a bomb had hit the room, mm. just paper everywhere, coffee cups. And what that meant, it was the effort that Michael Vanney, he was sitting there with a, with a sheaf of this copy in his hand, he was going through it, blind by line, blind, you know. And I got a real sense of that from that weekend, that week I spent with Michael Vanney at the Open in 05. Uh, I hadn't really appreciated uh, his genius at that stage, because I think, and this is not something that will be said and is ever said, we all have a sell-by day. And I think Hugh's sell-by day had passed when he went to the Sunday Times. I don't think we saw anything like the McIlvany we saw in the Observer when he was at the Sun Times. And certainly during my time at the Sunday Times, uh, he, was, he was gone by his best at that stage. When would he have went to the Sunday Times, give or take? He went in 93. He went to 93. Now I joined in 2000 and 2003, 2002. So certainly during the, my time with him, he, he was definitely gone by his best. But what really, really, really endeared me to him that week was the effort and the diligence and the devotion to his craft. Like to witness it was actually unbelievable. I really was blown away by every word. The words still matter to him. Mm. And, uh, I uh, made uh, I made dinner for the four of us that night, and he came in, poured him a large glass of Jugandas, and uh, he had his dinner, and he went back out to the conservatory. He was telling, giving us, regaling us with all stories about his career, and all, as, as he normally did. Uh, and he watched as I watched as I washed his plate, and I was more than happy to do it because that's uh, that's how good he was. He fed him and cleaned up after him. Yeah. I think that he definitely benefited. There was the perfect uh, timing for him because uh, he, he was in the greatest period for journalists too because they had, you know, um, good, uh, meaningful access to uh, to sports people. Uh, you know, you got hours with them. And that your piece last week with uh, Kenny uh, came across, that was meaningful access with someone instead of now that you're trying to cobble together some of their Instagram posts into a, an article that, uh, that might be printed in the newspaper. This was proper journalism, uh, which uh, I was saying to you earlier on, it, it, he, he might be the first of those journalists to be washed up on, 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 or the last of those journalists to be washed up on the shore, and everyone else then is a, is a carbon copy, but less and less uh, um, less and less of the old school and there's a new generation of journalists coming in the the twitter the instagram the the periscope everything else that i don't understand and i i, I can't uh, i can't fathom you know where journalism is going now for me uh, as a person that just enjoys reading it mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't just that he was eking out uh, this is what comes across with all the coverage you know the, uh, I've seen you too, you know, agonizing over o o over columns, um, or you've recounted how you've done it. And that's what comes out with him, but he, he was obviously quick-witted too, you know, because um, they the, the quote him about uh, his quips, uh, and he's very famous for what he said about Ali and about uh, Joe Bugner, when he was talking about Joe Bugner. Uh, in his prime, Joe Bugner had the, the physique of a Greek statue but fewer moves. Uh, if talent were elastic, Joe's pants would fall down. So you can, you can think about that, you can write that down and you have hours to consider it. But when you're in a press conference and Joe Bugner come, calls out and he says, uh, uh, get me Jesus Christ, I'll fight him. And McIlvany is straight back and he says, uh, uh, Joe, you're only saying that because he has bad hands, you know. So you don't, he, he was obviously, an extremely quick-witted and intelligent man and but he, what I get from you is that he he never tolerated um, uh, mediocrity yeah you know. there's a couple of paragraphs in this that are worth uh, are worth uh, recalling um, from his former editor from his former editor yeah um, this is a great one so he's talking about uh, on another occasion a sports editor rang 
uh, Hugh to find out how he was progressing. He replied gloomily, I'm having trouble with the colon. When the desk man offered sympathy, asking if he, if he was in pain, he replied, no. I mean, I can't decide if I need a colon or a semicolon in the sentence I'm struggling with. <laughs> Or, or this, he was lively, even exuberant company with a stock of funny stories from his past. The only except, exceptions were when he had discovered a grammatical or other mistake in his published story. Then a gloom would descend uh, that alcohol served only to deepen. He once rang the office in the early hours to ask the night out to change late spring to early summer. The night editor's response is not recorded. So that gives you a sense of how much... Yeah. The words matter. How 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 the words matter to him? Yeah, um, Tommy Conlon hits on that where he says those beautifully balanced sentences were wrought from hard labour over long hours. Constantly striving to be definitive was a torment uh, from which he never escaped. There mm. would have been a pressure for uh, on him. Yeah, to in be his Hugh later years, yeah. when he was seventy-one, there typing away in two thousand and five. There is a pressure when it's Hugh McIlvenny and you're on the back page uh, of the absolutely. Sunday Times. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, you can't produce your best stuff for 50 years Yeah. at all times. I think uh, he struggled to accept that, actually, you know. Um, I guess we all would uh, struggle to accept that, you know, our best is behind us. But I think Hugh, in particular, struggled with it. You know, I did, I did find that... Uh, you said at the end of your piece today, and the theme of your piece is The Words Mattered, that you asked him to sit down for an interview a couple of years ago? Yeah, I called him actually. Uh, I called him uh, about, I'd say about two and a half years ago, just before he retired uh, from the Sunday Times. I called him um, and I asked him would he sit down and, and talk to me uh, and do an interview for, for our paper, it's on the Independent. And one of the things I, I said to him a couple of times over the years was, look, when are you going to, you, you have to sit down and write your book. Mm. You have to tell the story of your life in sport and your sports writing career. I mean, that would have been truly, truly worth reading. Uh, and he, for, for whatever reason, and I don't know what it is, I have, I, I have a view on that and what it might be, but for whatever reason, he didn't want to do that. And I suspect it was the same reason he turned me down when I asked him would he sit down and, uh, and talk about his life in sport. Now, at the time, he said, look, I'm not finished yet, and there was stuff he wanted to do, and I accepted that, but I, I kind of thought there was more. Mm. And I kind of, my view on it would be that, uh, and this is, is not just particular to, 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 uh, to Hugh, but to a lot of people, uh, I think he would be very comfortable holding the mirror up to Muhammad Ali, and to great, but not as comfortable holding it to himself. Mm. I'm not sure... Uh, he would have done that. I think that's the reason he never wrote that book, that, that, that great book. And actually, Michael Parkinson, in his piece in the Sunday Times today, makes the same point, you know, the, the great regret that he didn't actually go and write, uh, write his autobiography, you know? Yeah, uh, Parkinson, so they've all the heavy hitters out in the Sunday mm -hmm. um, Times. Sir Alex Ferguson with Jonathan Northcroft is a big piece, and I think Ferguson is very genuine in his admiration of McIlvenny and Michael Parkinson as well where he did say that he said to him several times, you have to write your book, you know. Uh, Ferguson, Ferguson woke him on his, on his autobiography, yeah, he chose him for his autobiography. It's the best, I mean, it's the, by, Ferguson's done a few books. It's yeah. not surprisingly the best one by distance, and it was perfect timing in that it was published just after winning the treble, so yeah. it's kind of perfect. Yeah. But he talks in the piece with Northcroft as well about getting phone calls right across an 18-month period, and, you know, some nights he might ring me late into the night, is McClare with a big C or a small C? <laughs> Three, four times a day, you know? Um, but Ferguson, you know, like Ferguson sees the way, he just has a world view and it's, you know, he's shaped in uh, Govan and he does talk about several Scottish people at that time. Uh, he says, uh, Hugh came from the mining area, same as Jockstein, same as uh, Shankly, same as, uh, who's the Matt he's talking about? Oh, it must be Busby. Busby, yeah. Yeah, I was a bit different, I came from a shipbuilding area, but it is amazing the collective path all of us took. We all grew up, worked within 20, 30 miles of each other, industrial area of Scotland, producing exceptional people talked about how Michael Venny never went to college because he didn't do Latin at school. Uh, there was a breed of really clever, intelligent people who not only most of them were self-taught, but they also had to climb through the economic areas they came from. I always remember Jock Stein uh, saying to me about the mining area, when you're 300 feet below the earth, uh, you don't know the man next to you, but that's the person that will save your life. That's what it's like working down a pit. It's quite a profound meaning. Uh, so you suspect that Scottishness was a big part of the reason Ferguson felt an affinity uh, mm -hmm. with Michael Venny.
And uh, Graeme Soonis then alludes to that as well, you know, that uh, they ask Graeme for his uh, contribution. But the Michael Parkinson one, and it, it strikes me about, uh, you know, peers, you know, you're, uh, people can praise you left, right and centre, but until you get praise from your direct peers, yeah. you know, it's, it's, that's the ultimate accolade uh, in any profession. So when Peter O'Sullivan uh, was doing a, a, a book, he asked uh, people to contribute to the book and um, uh, Michael Parkinson alludes to this book in, the, in his, his article, he says, uh, uh, he, showed me the ar he showed the article to a colleague working on the charity project himself, a writer and broadcaster of talent and experience who read the article and said it was one of the very best he'd ever encountered. As he handed the article back to Sir Peter, he said, for God's sake, don't put that piece anywhere near my piece mm. in the book. Uh, no man should be allowed to write as well as that. And that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I had uh, my first uh, my first time to actually spend any time on um, My first time to notice him was in 1992 at the Barcelona Olympics. He was when Michael Crew was fighting in the final. He was sitting a couple of seats, and I could hear him shouting at Crew, you know, punch him, hit him, hit him, you know, right. like really engaged by right. by Crew and, and rooting for Crew. So that was my first time to actually uh, uh, be in his company as such as as a, as a writer. I was I was only two years started at that stage, and then in '98 I went to um, Las Vegas uh, the week before uh, Wayne McCullough was fighting Nassim Hamed, and he was there. He was writing for the Sunday Times, right. and we had dinner. Uh, we had dinner that that night together, and um, you know I can't remember a single thing about the dinner, not a single thing except that he was uh, drinking lovely wine and smoking a big cigar, which is which is crazy at the time. I think I would have been just totally overawed. I know he certainly was overawed by the fact that we were boat riding about uh, Nassim Hamed that week, mm. like to a degree that. It, I actually couldn't write almost. As in, oh, I, sh yeah. I cannot be writing I can't, about I can't this write in the same this, newspapers. In the same newspapers, this guy. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, no, no, he was um, a g genius, definitely a genius. Um, but again, of his time, for example, I mean, you can, you can go through the archives and uh, I don't know if he has ever written a single word about doping in sport, doping in boxing, doping in racing, doping in anything. It was, that was an area that, you know, he, he, he was never going to go in. Mm. Why not? Um, I don't know whether uh, it made him uncomfortable, whether his mind, the, 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 the pictures, the portraits he created of people made a space for that kind of thing, you know? Um, I'm not sure if that makes any sense. What I'm trying to say, I suppose, is, I mean... Um, yeah, I don't know. For example, well, he, laterally when he went to the Open, it was always about Woods. He had no time for the small guy hero who comes out and plays great this there week. There is a theme with his best stuff, i.e. George Best, Ali. Yeah. He's not so interested in the guy who's plodding away and finishing last. He does, he, there's maybe a romance in that story other people are quite attracted to. He's gone for the genius. He was the star writing about the star. He was interested in genius, and he wasn't in, interested in genius that came from uh, pharmacy. You know, basically, or okay. it was created by a pharmacy. Uh, that was a world he was unfamiliar with and, and wasn't particularly interested in visiting. Uh, and that's not a criticism, that's just a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, he was of his time and, and uh, he was the best of his time without question. Okay. Well, there's loads of coverage. Uh, the Ferguson piece, Northcroft puts a good story to him where he talks about... Um, McIlvany and Graeme Souness were debating at some dinner or other over whether or not Lionel Messi, Souness's choice, was greater than Maradona, who was McIlvany's. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he says, an exasperated Souness, this is Jonathan Northcroft writing as part of the Ferguson piece, an exasperated Souness had to finally say, look, no one wants to have to do this, because look, I played against Maradona five times and I'm telling you, it's Messi. Hugh growled back, I don't care who you played against, it's Diego. Told this one, I would side with Sunus and that one says uh, Ferguson. Yeah, but, what does uh, that tell you? See, that's interesting in itself. When I when I when I when I made that point about holding up the mirror, mm. see that, that there's an example of that. Uh, I remember vividly in 1994 at the World Cup, he had this absolutely humongous row with Eamon Dunphy. You know, I don't know, I don't know whether they were, they were in the bar drinking together, but they had this absolutely incredible row, <laughs> and I can just imagine. 
I can just imagine what, what might have happened. Aim would have expressed the view about a certain player or whatever. Hugh, of course, no, no, it was really rubbish to two of them would have gone at each other like, you know, stags. Okay. You know. But again, in fairness, you you you're arguing with Graham soon as who's played against you know, five how, times. You know. <laughs> I mean, that, that suggests a certain arrogance, arrogance I don't yeah. know. Well, Ferguson even says, well, look, I'm with Sunus. Yeah. But then he says, though I can imagine Hugh's response, you don't effing know what you're talking about while blowing a big puff of smoke in your face. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess you need arrogance as well, and the, and the other, the other The other quote was that when he was, again, uh, de de defending Diego Maradona, um, uh, some, one of the footballers was saying that you didn't play against Diego Maradona, how can you judge him? He said, I didn't write with Shakespeare either. But uh, yeah. so he, 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 he was, I imagine, I have never met him, uh, but uh, I'd say he was never boring to be around. No. No. Uh, the piece in The Observer, finally, then, on McIlvenny is probably worth digging out if you actually want to read. It was the <laughs> one place that reprinted something he'd written. So this was 1974, after Ali beat Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle. Like, in fairness, though, he got to s go to Ali's house for two hours after the fight. It yes. doesn't matter, Joe. It's still absolutely No, it doesn't matter. It's what phenomenal. you do with it. No, it's I what appreciate you do with it. that. It's still it's what phenomenal. You do with it. But it, on Woods, it is then a pity in 05 that he spends no time with Woods. He has to sit in the house and eat your cooking. <laughs> you know, it's just a sign, of, you know, to Gary's point that the sport, the industry changed. Yes, it did. It did. And it certainly, uh, that, that wouldn't have, uh, have worked. But he certainly got access to, to a lot of people, even laterally in his career. I mean, I remember him sitting down with Andy Murray for about, they got about three hours around right, okay. one stage. So no, he did, he did, uh, he was still the name. Mm. This piece with Ali in '74 is absolutely oh, phenomenal. Yeah. Just the words, every sentence is. Yeah, but just you could fantastic. go back. I mean, I could give you, I give you forty, fifty of those pieces from sure. this, from that time and what he did. Yeah. That you would, you would. Uh, this Johnny Owen piece about the young Welsh boxer yeah. who, who died was just f incredible. That's the famous line about being articulate. Yeah. In, in a the language, language of boxing. Yeah. I, uh, listen yeah. to us destroy one of the great quotes. Yeah. But yeah that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So he, uh, the, the quote is that outside the ring he was inaudible and almost in invisible personality. Inside he became astonishingly positive and self-assured. He seemed to be more at home there than anywhere else. It is his tragedy that he found himself articulate in such a dangerous language. That's about Johnny Owen who died in the ring. And Muhammad Ali's rumble in the jungle. We should have known that Muhammad Ali would not settle for any ordinary old resurrection. Um, he, um, he had to have an astonishing flourish. So having rolled away the rock, he hit George Foreman over the head with it. Mm. So it's like the sentence is finished, reads beautifully, and then you just go and another little bit, and you just go, oh my God. Yeah. That, uh, that's, what the, that, that's the opening yeah. to this 74 yeah. piece, and mm -hmm. on it goes and goes. He talked, he says of Ali sitting there, he talked with the quiet contentment of a man whose thoughts were acting on him as comfortingly as the hands of a good masseur. Just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Every sentence is yeah. rock solid, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, did you... Um, in the kind of quieter moments in the house when you're chatting away with him? Well, he held court, Hugh, you know. Okay. He held court. And uh, I was more than happy to sit back and, and listen to him. Um, uh, I wasn't comfortable engaging with him because he could get quite nasty with drink on him, you know, and that's come across a lot of the piece as well. He would get quite... I think he actually... It might have come to blows with Eamon back in the day. Eamon is a voice I actually wanted to hear on him. I think he'd have some interesting things to say. Uh, so I kind of kept him at a, at a, at a distance, um, so didn't get close to him, uh, but was happy to listen to him um, because he certainly had plenty to say and interesting things to say. And again, an ama amazing life. One of the good things, one of the great things he's done since he's retired is a series on with Radio Scotland, BBC Radio, about his critics, about six episodes of right. podcast. Uh, and I've seen that done, and I'd say that's out because it, it wasn't just that he could write his voice then, he had the power of... Uh, a yeah, great voice. Articulation was just superb, and his word power is uh, phenomenal. Yeah, okay. So that's Michael Venny, and there's coverage across the papers.